and welcome back to the Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's Bea, and I will be hosting today's podcast. Today, we will be talking to Professor Jochen Marotzke, who is director for the department, The Ocean in the Earth's System, at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Hamburg, Germany. We talk about his research on the ocean and how it is affected by climate change. More specifically, we talk about the warming of the ocean, why sea levels are rising, should we be worried about sea level rising, and what are some solutions to slow down the rising sea levels. We also touch on both nature-based solutions on how to reduce climate change, but also what is the best way forward to reduce CO2 emissions. Professor Marotzka also talks about the use of climate models in his research and in general about his views on climate change. I hope you will enjoy this podcast. Thank you so much for joining the podcast today. Why don't you just start by introducing yourself? Yeah, uh, hello, uh, I'm Jochen Marotzke. Um, I'm one of the directors here at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology, um, and we do climate research here at this institute. Yeah, very hot topic these days. Very hot, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so um, what kind of research do you specifically do? Because climate change is such a large field of study? It's a big field. We do fundamental research into how climate change functions. Uh, on our webpage we say uh, we investigate the changing climate of our earth. That's what we do. So this is pretty broad. So we, we research not only the human-caused climate change, we also do a lot of research on how climate functions in principle sometimes uh, how climate functions on other planets or how climate may have functioned 700 million years ago on Earth. So we take a very, very broad view of the changing climate of our Earth. But part of it is, of course, how humans change the climate. Yeah, I think a lot of talk in the media right now is solely focused on the way that humans influence climate change. There's not so much talk on maybe the natural variability, or actually really interesting that you also study how on other planets climate change That is that. true, and, and of course it, it's understandable because what, you, what many people are concerned with, what, what affects people's lives, is of course how humans are changing climate now and what we can do about it. Uh, if we if we look at how how climate um, works on other planets or may have worked or may have worked in the past, I would see that more as a general scientific interest. Um, maybe the same way how people are interested in how a supernova um, mm -hmm. functions or the, the recent photograph of a black hole. And uh, so it's, it's exciting for those interested in science, but it, it, it speaks uh, sort of really to, to a very different desire compared to when people are concerned with how humans are changing Earth's climate right now. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I definitely want to be going back to talking about also how climate change affects other plants, because that sounds very interesting. But maybe let's just start more by talking about specifically what you do. I saw on your website that you're the director for like oceans and the influence on their atmosphere, right? Yeah. The, so yeah, that we, research. Yeah, I, I call it, when I started, I thought a bit about it and I called it the ocean in the earth system. And, and that's really our program and has been ever since. Uh, so we look at how the ocean functions, but not so much the ocean per se, but really how the ocean plays a role in in climate, in the interaction with the atmosphere. And uh, so some of what we do is purely how the ocean works, but a lot of it is how ocean atmosphere interacts. And also a big part is how, how ocean absorbs and, and, and transports carbon around. Carbon is very important for mm. climate change. Humans are changing the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. Some of that goes into the ocean. And there is a question Will that continue to be like that? Will the ocean continue to take up carbon? Where does that carbon go? And so on. So, so that, that is also what we do. So 
very much from this, as we say, from the coupled perspective, the ocean is part of a larger system. That's really mm -hmm. the focus of what we do. So then let's start by talking about the ways in which the carbon, uh, the ocean can take up carbon um, and how it's impacted by climate change. Yeah, the, um, the ocean takes takes up about one quarter of what humans emit into the atmosphere. Very roughly of things we emit, emit into the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide, half stays in the atmosphere, half goes into the land biosphere, plants on land, and the, uh, the uh, sorry, I should start again and correct myself, half goes into the, uh, half remains in the atmosphere, one quarter goes into the land biosphere, and one quarter yeah. goes into the ocean, very roughly. And the processes by which they go into the ocean, that carbon goes into the ocean, they, they are reasonably well understood. Part of it is, oh, it is dissolved in the surface ocean, and then some is transported downward by ocean currents. Some is taken up by, by plankton, by, mm -hmm. by small plants in the ocean, and, and they consume the carbon, and, and they die, and some, some of the, the, that debris falls down to the deeper ocean and takes that way it takes carbon down. So we know in principle how it functions, but the big unknown is how will that change in the future? Yeah. We know the areas in the ocean where that downward transfer occurs. It's most, mostly in the North Atlantic and in the ring of ocean around Antarctica called the Southern Ocean. So we, and, and especially the Southern Ocean, it's very hard to predict how they will change in the future because uh, the processes there are difficult to simulate in our models and because they are difficult to simulate, it's hard mm. to predict how they will change. And so much of our effort is geared towards building better models of the ocean that then will do a better, more reliable job of predicting how in the future the Southern Ocean will take up carbon and transport that carbon down. So oceans are extremely important to act as carbon sinks, basically. They are very important to act as carbon sinks. The oceans really play an important role here. And in some way, the ocean does as a dual service us humankind. Uh, the ocean does two things to slow down uh, climate change. One is, as I said, the ocean takes up mm -hmm. a quarter of the carbon. Let's imagine a world without an ocean, then all that carbon would remain in the atmosphere and climate change would progress faster, would proceed faster. So there's one service that the ocean does to us. The ocean does another service. It takes up energy, it takes up heat. And that slows down the, uh, the, the climate change. If, um, if the ocean did not absorb that heat and transfer it down, then uh, also climate change will progress faster. Mm. So the yeah. ocean does two services, takes up heat, in a way it cools, it tempers the heating, and the ocean uh, takes up the carbon. But the ocean, ocean also pays a dear price for that. Yeah. For the carbon, it takes up the carbon, the price it pays, it gets more acidic. It's ocean acidification, which, for example, attacks some of the, 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 the small animals that live, the, those that form shells, calciferous uh, shells, and, and so the ocean gets more acidic, mm -hmm. and it's harder for some, some, uh, uh, some living entities to, to, to survive in the ocean. Yeah. The other price the ocean pays, it expands. Exactly, yeah. It takes up, it takes up the heat, does us a service, but it expands because it gets warmer, warmer water expands, and so the sea level rises. So that service of the ocean does not come for free, and it will not go on forever. So the ocean helps us, but there is a price to pay, and it won't last for eternity. Yeah, well, like with everything, there's always advantages and disadvantages. There's to always a, system. a price to pay. There's no such a thing as a free lunch, and, and we have that too. That slowing down of climate change through the ocean yeah. comes with consequences. Yeah, so as you mentioned, so sea levels are rising. I think most people also are well aware of the fact that sea levels are rising. So are we talking about sea levels rising everywhere or are there particular places in the ocean where the sea levels are rising more? 
it's not homogeneous, so sea levels are not rising everywhere, and, and that makes it, that's another big part of also the research we do to understand why they are not rising the same way everywhere. For example, if you look in the, in the tropical eastern Pacific, sea levels have been falling over the past 20 to 30 years. They have not been rising. Okay. Now, this has been taken by climate change deniers as to poo-poo the, the result that sea levels go up, which is complete nonsense because on yeah. global average, it's very clear that sea level rises. And the fact that in some parts of the ocean, sea level goes down a bit means it rises ever faster in other parts, say the Western tropical Pacific. Their sea level has risen at about twice the global rate. So, so, so there is a heterogeneity in, 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 in how sea level, sea level rises. Part of it comes from how the wind drives ocean currents. Okay. Uh, and, and therefore, and the winds may change. Uh, we've seen a strengthening of the, of the wind system in the eastern tropical Pacific, what we call the trade winds. They blow more from the, from the northeast, the classical trade winds, we probably all know them. And they have increased in strength for reasons that we don't understand. And because they have increased in strength, they've pushed waters more to the western edge of the Pacific. And that has led to this mm -hmm. decrease in sea level in the eastern Pacific. As I said, we don't really know uh, why that is, but it's, it's, it's well observed. And, and so one of the questions we then have, and of course a question that, the, uh, that people who live on the small islands in the Pacific have is, will this pattern continue? Will it continue to be, will there continue to be more sea level in the western tropical Pacific compared to the east? Will that pattern change? And, and it's very hard to say. We're really not sure there. Yeah. And, and there's another, maybe more, almost for most people, probably exotic way of why sea level is not the same everywhere. And that is, if you, if you look at Greenland, Greenland has a massive ice sheet. It's about three kilometers thick. And that ice sheet is melting. And that melting ice that melts yeah. the water flows into the ocean and sea level rises. But there is one other effect that is not so obvious. That big, fat, massive ice sheet sitting there also exerts a gravitational pull, a horizontal gravitational pull on the water. Huh. And because that water, that ice sheet goes down, the gravitational pull, the horizontal pull towards Greenland gets less. And therefore, the net effect of in the vicinity of Greenland, of Greenland melting is actually that sea level drops yeah, in the very vicinity sense. of Greenland and the water is exported elsewhere. Elsewhere, of course, the sea level rises more than, and more than average. So this yeah. is a really peculiar way of, and, and, and uh, when, when one first hears it, very surprising uh, aspect of sea level rise, of inhomogeneous sea level rise. And the third contribution that we, people in Scandinavia see that very clearly, that locally there, sea level also falls. It does not rise, it falls. And what we see there is that Scandinavia still recovers from the last ice age in the sense that there was also a massive ice sheet sitting on Scandinavia, suppressing Scandinavia into the Earth's mantle, that ice melted, and now we see what we call the post-glacial rebound. The pressure is away, is off, and now the land rises, and the land rises faster than the sea level goes up. So locally, yeah. sea level falls. Yeah. So we have a number, if you look at, if every person looked at where, where they live, uh, it, it's not at all clear to say um, by how much sea level rises, and maybe even whether it rises, but just to make that absolutely clear, most people, where most people live, they are affected by sea level rise. If we look at many of the big cities in the world, almost all of them experience rise of the surrounding sea level. That, that is very clear. But the picture is complicated. Yeah, it seems very complicated. I actually, I when I was thinking about it, I was like, I think maybe not everywhere sea level rises, but you also assume that on a, on average sea level is rising. On so. average sea level rises, and as I sometimes say, uh, sea level is is like taxes and death. 
Yeah. It comes for sure. There's yeah. There's no way of escaping it. And we have already, through the warming we have created in the past, we have already committed for centuries, really centuries of further sea level rise that is completely uh, uh, um, unpreventable, unstoppable. There will be sea level rise for a long time to come, just from the from that one degree of global warming that we as humans have already caused. And, and sea level remembers that past warming history for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. So we talked briefly about that since the ocean is warming, that's one of the contributing factors for why sea level is rising. Are there any other reasons why the sea level is rising other than temperature? The main uh, the, the main other contribution is uh, that land ice melts and uh, so the, the, the large ice sheets uh, on Greenland and Antarctica but also uh, uh, alpine or, or mountain glaciers in, in the Alps, uh, Alaska, the Himalayas, there, there are lots of glaciers and they melt uh, almost everywhere in the world. Uh, 97% or so of all mountain glaciers reduce in volume and that water eventually flows into the ocean and, and that also leads to sea level rise. Currently uh, we estimate that about half of the sea level rise is due to the ocean warming and expanding. The other half is from land ice melting and that water flowing into the ocean but we expect that in the future the contribution from the land ice melt will increase and will, will, uh, will dominate the total sea level rise. There are small contributions from other effects, for example, where the land, the ground soils can store more water, the mm. groundwater level may increase or decrease. That's an effect that is important seasonally. Say when there is an El Nino, then, then that influences how much water is stored. What's an El Nino? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, El Nino is, 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 a, is a warming of the tropical eastern Pacific uh, and, and sometimes around Christmas time uh, when it gets unusually warm there. And then the whole weather patterns in, the, uh, in, the, in, 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 in and around the Pacific changes. And for, for example, then where, where it's normally dry in Mesoamerica and, 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 and in South America, Southern North America, they may yeah. have torrential rainfalls. On the other side, Indonesia, when it's normally very wet, it, they have unusual, unusually dry climate when okay. an El Nino event happens. And it's called El Nino, the Spanish for the child, because it was first observed around Christmas. Mm -hmm. So it was named yeah. after the Christ child. And, and, and El Nino influences plant growth on land, it influences how much water is stored on land. So we see in measurements, when an El Nino happens, we see we can see some change in, in sea level because some more water is stored on, on land. But long term, that effect is very minor. And the two really big effects, the two ones that count, is the ocean warms and expands yeah. and there's less ice on, on land and that water flows into the ocean. One more brief question about the El Nino. So does that happen like every year? Does that happen on a regular basis? I don't know, every five years or is it completely random? It's irregular. It's not completely random. It's, uh, it happens sort of every two to seven years. And you can see from that stretch. Yeah. It's quite irregular. But if we had a period for 10 years without El Nino, we would start wondering what's happening. So okay. there's a certain regularity in it but but not much and and it's always uh, the 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 height of it is always around december january february uh and uh so it's tied to the seasons and and what we always have if an el nino event has happened the year after tends to be very warm globally okay you may say ah but this is the said tropical uh pacific but the tropical Pacific is large, it's huge. Mm. The Pacific is a huge ocean and the tropics take up a lot of uh, space. And so if the tropical Pacific is warmer than usual, that leaves an imprint also on the global average because yeah. the tropical Pacific is so large. And therefore, 
we uh, the the year following uh, an El Nino event or a year that has an El Nino event in January February tends to be warmer than usual, and you may have seen that that uh, I think the last year. No, I'm I'm afraid I can't quite get the name. I would have to look up the exact year where it was. Twenty sixteen. That is say, uh, or maybe it was twenty eighteen. Twenty eighteen was not an El Nino year, and still it was very warm. So I remember, yeah, yeah, that's true. But, like 2018, 2019 I th I think was very, was very warm. Warm, yeah. I think the 2016 followed a large El Nino, and 2016 yeah. has been the record year, if I got my dates right uh, off the top of my head. We can always, like, yeah. fact check that and yeah. put it in the show yeah. notes. Yeah, and, uh, and I, and... But the, the, there was one of the other years, and I think it was 2018, where, and this is why this was so remarkable that we said, well, in some way, not, no, no El Nino to push the temperature up, and still it was very warm. Do we know why? No. No. There, no. Are, other things, there are other things that influence the global temperatures on a year-to-year -year basis, so it, global temperature fluctuates on a year-to-year -year yeah. basis, uh, plus, minus... 0.2 degrees we could have so so for for some way for no apparent reason a year could be warmer by 0.2 degrees or colder by 0.2 mm. degrees if an El Nino happened before then we say ah yeah we know why it's it may be warmer than usual but there are many other things uh, that fluctuate the the other big part of the globe if you wish is you you Eurasia uh, Siberia it's a huge landmass and it's very strongly influenced by random variability in the atmosphere. So uh, we've seen a period, early 2000s, say, we've seen a period of about 15 years where there was an unusual cooling trend in, the, in winter over Siberia. Mm. And it happened. Yeah. Things, sometimes things just happen. And uh, with no no apparent cause and uh, and so and that also contributes to to to, to fluctuations in, in in the global atmospheric temperature yeah i know that's why i often think i mean i guess thinking a bit about climate models as well sometimes i find it very hard to grasp how you guys measure what kind of global temperature rises because of humans what is because of the natural variability and then how you all put that into climate models to try to predict what's going to happen or explain certain things? Well, you're asking the right question. It is one of the most difficult questions to answer in our field and one of the most important questions to answer. How much of the fluctuation we see or how much of the change we see, maybe I should put it this way, how much of the change we see is due to natural fluctuation and how much is due to, to uh, the human effect? And that's it's very, very hard to do. By now, we have a clear answer on the warming, the global surface warming, uh, and, and the latest statement we made in, in, the, in the report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is this group of scientists asked by the United mm -hmm. Nations every six to seven years to assess the IPCC, the IPCC yeah. to assess what we know about climate. And in our latest report we published last year in August, we wrote, uh, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land surface. Unequivocal. There is no scientific doubt that we as humans are responsible for that warming. It took a long time to get to this certainty. Hmm. But for temperature rise, we can say this was humans. There is no scientific doubt. For other quantities, it's much harder to say. For example, has strong precipitation it has increased in places mm -hmm. was that the human effect and if you look and we also put that in there's only one region in the world we've divided the world into 20 into 42 different regions and for each region, my colleagues said how how certain are we how much confidence do we have that it was really the human effect that led to this increase in strong precipitation and of the 42, there's one region, Scandinavia, Northern Europe, where we are really confident that it was humans. There is one other reason, central region, Central North America, 
where we are moderately sure it was where we moderate confidence that it was the human effect and everywhere else 40 other reasons there's low confidence that the observed trend mm. is due to humans we just don't know it may well be we can't exclude it and it may well emerge as a human driven change in the future but currently we are not sure and so you have we have this huge range for temperature we are certain yeah for precipitation change strong precipitation uh, events it's 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 very unclear yet so and that that shows how difficult uh, as as a general problem how difficult this separation into human effect natural variability is and this is why the fact that it's so difficult is of course also the reason why Klaus Hasselmann last year won the mm. Nobel Prize in Physics. He was the founding director of my institute here. And Klaus Hasselmann showed us in 1979, in a, in a breathtaking paper, how in principle we could discern the human fingerprint in, in all those fluctuations, in all that noise, how to go about it. And, and the difficulty of the problem is properly reflected in the fact that he received the Nobel Prize for that. That was actually my next question. How can you, with global temperature rise, how can you be certain that it is also because of humans, whereas then with the precipitation, you're not sure? Like, What is there in those models that make you certain? Well, m m maybe the most important thing it is, is it is in the observations. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Model, models are indispensable for, understand what is, for understanding what is going on and also for, for detecting the human influence. But at the bottom of everything is the observation and uh, that temperatures uh, have gone up. And what, what Hasselmann did was he said, look, if I just took temperature measurements all over the globe, I have many very good records, hundreds of good stations that had measured temperature for a long time. He showed and argued why it is a difficult statistical problem to find out that really things are going going up and for for a uh, for a particular reason and not just mm. like that. And what he then suggested is the following uh, let us rather than trying to to build the the effect of or the, the influence of humans from the individual station data and piece it together. Let us use a model and let us use a model to say, what do we expect? What pattern do we expect? And, and models show us very clearly what pattern to expect. For example, at the surface, the Arctic warms a lot faster than the rest of the globe. That's what models show us we should expect from an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. There's another effect that models show us we should expect, another pattern, which is the stratosphere should cool. The region mm. in the atmosphere above, say, 12, 14 kilometers, depending on where you are. The troposphere is where the weather occurs. The troposphere will warm, but the stratosphere will cool. And that's a very robust result from models and we understand well why that happens. So there's another pattern. CO2 increase means tropospheric cooling, uh, tropospheric warming, stratospheric yeah. cooling. So we have two elements of a pattern. And then Hasselmann said, and now let us assume the pattern is there, that's our hypothesis, and let's see whether we find that pattern in the observations. Mm. And it's much, much easier to look for a pattern than trying to piece something together afterwards. And he showed that what we call statistical significance. So does it has the signal risen out of the noise? Uh, it's much, much improved by doing it this way. And that was the way in which he and his group, uh, people working with him some 20, when was it 25, 26 years ago, could identify human fingerprint in climate. And what's interesting is, and, and no, maybe what you should say, what I've been asked this question and I don't know the answer whether this idea to first define a pattern and then look for it, whether this has been used in other areas of science. I don't know whether it has. Yeah. 
in our field, this was a, this came out of nothing, his idea to do this. Define the pattern first and then look for it. But you probably noticed that when the uh, gravitational waves were discovered five, six years ago, for which people got the confirmation, uh, one more confirmation of general relativity theory, uh, Einstein, and people got the Nobel Prize for that. That detection followed the same principle. With a numerical model, people first defined patterns they were looking for in the, in the data, and then they identified the pattern in, 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 in the data that they got from those huge observatories. So, so that idea is much more general than, than just from climate mm. research, but I have not, maybe my ignorance speaking, but I don't know that, that this idea has been, has been expressed in another field of research. And that's another reason. So it's a very, very generous strategy for detecting a signal in noisy data, and another reason why this deservedly, why it deservedly won the Nobel Prize in physics, because it's really such a broad, fundamental idea that it applies to many other areas of physics too. Yeah. Do you use this kind of idea of detecting a pattern first in, I don't know, when you study the ocean or rising sea levels? We, we don't at this institute any longer, which is maybe a bit ironic, but the idea has taken off and, and, and is, is applied all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> Say the person working with Klaus then, she was a postdoc here, uh, Gabriele Hegel, she's now a professor at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And many other people use these techniques and in the reports by the IPCC, the, the six reports have come out and every one of them had a chapter or a sub-chapter on what's called detection and attribution. Mm. Building on Hasselmann's idea, now that they have other ideas have joined that, but the core of answering the questions, are, human responsible, are humans responsible for this change, is the method that, that was invented by Klaus Hasselmann. So that there has been a huge legacy uh, in the field and I would say, if we hadn't been so sure that it's humans responsible for the observed climate change, for crucial parts of the observed climate change, I am sure there would never have been a Paris Agreement on curbing further climate change, yeah. because the doubts would have lingered too strongly. Is it, is it really us humans, which implies can really do something, but it's, it, it goes back to Hasselmann's work that we, we were so certain and we could already in 2015 or, or around 2010, we could say, okay, there's a, there's a tiny margin mm -hmm. of error, but yeah, we just wait a bit. We, we know it's the humans. Yeah. So another question about climate models that I always find very hard to understand is just climate change is so complex. There are so many things that you need to factor in when you use climate models. So how do you make sure that you really factor in everything? We can't ever be sure that everything is in there. So we got to be humble there. But um, we are reasonably certain that we, we're reasonably certain that we, we're not missing anything that's really important. And I guess you could always change, like maybe your climate models would change year by year uh, if you design them differently it's, or you factor in something well, that you discover. Well, the, 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 model, the model remains the same. It may be worth explaining what a, what a, what a climate model is, well, yeah, how, how it functions. Yeah, that's a good idea. There's, um, uh, one, what, one way of characterizing it, what we sometimes say, it's a digital twin of the real Earth. <laughs> so, so we try to build the real Earth, but in a, in a digital universe. And what do we mean by that? Most important thing is, we know the real climate is governed by some fundamental laws of nature. Mass is conserved, energy is conserved, momentum is conserved, so mm -hmm. Newton's laws of motion. These are fundamental laws of nature. We know if you go to, to the very small, the very big, uh, and so on, the very fast, that you have effects where, where these classic Laws of classical physics are no longer valid, but for climate, we, we can we we know that these laws are true and are valid. Newton's laws of motion, energy is conserved, mass is conserved. 
water is conserved. And we express these conservations mathematically. They are equations that we know are correct. And then we solve these equations on computers now, and that, that's when it gets tricky. Uh, the, these equations are very, very hard. They have a very complicated mathematical structure. They're very hard to solve. We have turbulence in them, which makes life hard, make, mm. which makes equations hard to solve. And so what we do is we, we solve the equations not in, um, as we say, in the continuous form, there, that, that for a continuum at, at every, every point in the world this equation is valid, we solve the equation on what we call a grid or a mesh. We say we have one grid point maybe here and the next one is 50 kilometers away. Okay. <laughs> and we, we, we assume that this grid point is representative for its surroundings. And when we do that, we can solve these equations uh, on a large computer. We start from some initial state, say, what did the ocean do a year ago? And, and we, we start from that state, and then we use the equation, and the equations tell me how things evolve in the future. And, and that we do many times over, and then when we've done that, so, so that is also why I mean the we, we create a digital twin. The observed world does not enter, not in the first instance. We really create a digital twin of the Earth, if you wish, from scratch. Mm -hmm. It is created independently of what we observe. And what we then do is we take observations and check how well are we doing. Did did the, say, the warming, the global warming of the 20th century, do we reproduce that in a sensible way? Or the temperature patterns, we have, well, tropics are warm, poles are cold. The temperature drop from the tropics to the pole, does our model recreate that yeah. from, from the laws of nature? So we've done, we as a field, we've done thousands of tests of these models and uh, that is that is also something that's often overlooked. If you if you look at the at the publications in climate research and modeling papers, the large majority of modeling papers has to do with the evaluation of the model. Yeah, I see, can imagine. To see how how yeah. well are we doing, and if we are not doing well, why is that? And that usually gives us a hint at what to do better. Uh, so we we look at how processes occur. We have. Sometimes you have very good observations of certain processes, say in how a cloud forms and, and how the air rises, there are observations. And we try to look in models, how do, do the models do that? And we, when we find discrepancies, we try to improve the representation mm. of clouds in models. And so, so this is also why uh, I mean, this, this goes on unnoticed by the public. This is technical yeah. work, really, really important work, but technical work for an outsider not very exciting. If, if I tell you, well, the, the, the model is too warm east of Boston by 1.5 degree, you would say, well, I couldn't care less. Yeah. Rightly so. Why, why should anyone outside our field be excited about it? And that's, that's just fine. But it, it, it's a foundation on which statements are built, which exactly. then do catch the interest exactly. of the public. And I guess that's also why I'm so interested in how good the climate models really are, because in the end, you make statements based on the models. Yeah. And, and so what we, uh, what we do uh, is, <clears throat> so the, the typical part of, or a large part of modeling is this type of evaluation for which we need observations, we need measurements. And, and that also makes this question of how good are the models for the purpose or how good are the predictions, that makes it difficult. Um, and um, in, in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC, the one that came out in 2013, I was one of the two people in charge of the chapter on model evaluation. Yeah. And so I can tell firsthand what happened, what, 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 what did, did people want to know? Essentially, the, largely they wanted to know Tell us the models are good enough for what we apply them for. 
Yeah. But please spare us the gory detail. <laughs> um, I'm exaggerating a bit, <laughs> but it 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 it, it we, we felt a bit like the uh, uh like the, the bit shady cousin of the family. Yeah, we 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 got to invite him, but let's not let's let not seat him at the center exactly, table. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because the, 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 the contents of the chapter is technical and I think for many people not very exciting. Yeah. But fair enough. But just absolutely necessary and also difficult. I mean, the, the epistemology of model evaluation is really hard because I, I can only check the models for the past. But yeah. what people want to know is how good are our predictions for the 21st century? And that's hard, that's very hard, because n normally if you contrast that with weather forecasting, um, I mean, we've had thousands and thousands of days for which to check our weather forecast. Yeah. Wait till tomorrow and you'll see whether the forecast was good. Not, not quite that simple. Even weather forecasting evaluation, if I say there's a 50% chance of rain tomorrow and it rains, does that mean my forecast, forecast was good? So just, just mm -hmm. checking tomorrow does not cut it. But still, weather forecasting has had so many instances of being checked. They know very well what they do well and what they do not do well. It's much harder for us. If I make a forecast for 2100, gee, yeah. I've got to wait 80 years to check that forecast. I mean, that's no, nonsensical. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't want to wait. I can't wait. And, and even, I mean, my, and my forecast has, is always conditioned on human behavior in the future. So... So, so this is a, uh, this is a, this is a hard, fundamentally hard problem, uh, and, and we, what we do is we, we try to make educated guesses of what we think is needed to make a good forecast. Uh, that there's a, a philosopher of science, Wendy Parker, who, who wrote about the adequacy for purpose. And she said, let, let us look into the future. If I want to make a good forecast for 2050 for temperature, global temperature, mm -hmm. what do I need to get right? What do I think I need to get right yeah. in order to make a good forecast? And then let me check back whether these things are fulfilled in, in, in the past. So, so you're I'm breaking down the model into small, the question to smaller pieces. I'm not just asking, is this a good model? Is this model reliable? That's too big a question. But is this model adequate for this particular purpose? Yeah. And although I can never find an absolutely definitive answer for such a long-term prediction, um, at least I cannot, not in my lifetime, I, I, I find decent and maybe useful answers. Yeah. Um, and and that, that, is, that is how we work. That, that is why eventually we, we build trust in in our models or where we know, gee, we really got to be careful with models here. Yeah. Would you say that the field is mainly based on the, what the models predict in the future and you kind of research what's going to happen in the future or you more look at the past and say, this is what we have in the past and based on the past, these are the decisions that we're going to make in the future? I would I would have to guess because someone someone would have to look at the actual yeah. body of literature, but my guess is that overall more work more papers are published on the past because that's where we have the observations. So all observational work in that sense is geared towards the past, directed towards the past. The uh, model evaluation looks at the past, and so even though there are many papers looking at the predictions uh, for the future. I think the majority of the papers are published on things that that lie in the past. Yeah. Just out of necessity, but also because uh, at some level, if you want to... Some way models can never tell us what the world is, how the world is. That can only come from empirical evidence. Models help us explore our ideas and uh, deepen our ideas. They, they help us find consistency between different observations. Um, and, and so, so there, there are man, many, many things that the models do and that why models are necessary, but, uh, but they can never tell us that's the way it is. Yeah. 
And so, so for that, that there's always, if you wish, in terms of papers written, number of papers written, it's probably always have to be a bias towards the past. It, it's almost, almost, almost has to be. <laughs> I feel like that's a natural thing as yes. well, because you're yeah. certain about the past. You're not right. certain no, about not the future. Yeah. And, and, and I think so, uh, that, that would have to be checked. I mean, someone almost like a sociologist of, of climate research would have to check whether, whether, yeah. whether what I say is true, just from the published literature. But it's definitely what I expect. Because yeah. that, that builds a foundation for, for those who want to look into the future. Yeah, I mean, I've completely sidetracked. I told myself in this podcast, I'm going to be talking about climate models at the end, because <laughs> may, I don't know how many people are interested in climate models. And then we just talk, I don't know, 40 minutes on climate models at the beginning. So let's go back to rising sea levels, yeah. <laughs> since we were talking about that. And I guess something that I didn't, we didn't talk about yet is the oceans warming. So you mentioned that the oceans are warming because global temperature is rising. Mm -hmm. Is that the only reason why oceans are warming? Yeah. Okay. That, that's really, and, and that's, uh, you asked how, how sh why are we so sure that humans cause the climate change in terms of physical explanation. I mean, I, I told you the more the statistical approach that Hasselman mm. introduced. But at a more intuitive level, there, there's another argument which physically I find much easier to grasp. And that is, <coughs> if we look at what is the greenhouse effect, human-induced greenhouse effect. You know effect. what, pause there and maybe let's just take two minutes to explain the gre yeah. greenhouse I effect will. for people that don't yeah. know that. What is the greenhouse effect is, let's look at the natural greenhouse effect, effect first. What happens, we have an atmosphere around the earth and sunlight hits the ground, the ground warms, the ground radiates back, but that radiation uh, is caught by what we call greenhouse gases. It's absorbed by these greenhouse gases. The most important greenhouse gases are water vapor and carbon dioxide, CO2. And that energy that the ground emits is absorbed by the atmosphere, by the, by the greenhouse gases, but that energy has to go somewhere, it cannot just stay there, and then it's re-emitted by the atmosphere. It's emitted upward, and it's emitted downward. And the net effect means that the ground receives extra energy, the one that is, comes from the atmosphere. And that's a greenhouse effect, so we have more radiation arriving at the ground, and that leads to warming. There's another way of putting it, is that at a certain temperature, <coughs> Not all of the radiation from the ground makes it to space. Some of it is held back. And, and that is, um, I should start differently, I'm sorry for that. So, so what I just described, that's a natural greenhouse effect. That is important to keep Earth warm. What is it we humans are now doing? We are increasing the concentration of CO2 of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so we have a stronger greenhouse effect. And that means there's an additional amount of energy held back. And that energy has to go somewhere. And if you look at where does it go, more than 90% of it goes into the ocean. It goes into ocean warming. A little bit goes into atmospheric warming, but just the amount of energy is tiny. And the reason is that the ocean is this big, fat, massive reservoir, this huge heat capacity, as we call it. Uh, and, and so the ocean warms. First by a little, but to warm the ocean, you need a huge amount of energy compared to all other elements in the climate system. And the thing is now we find that energy. So the greenhouse and the, 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 the human-induced greenhouse effect means we hold energy back in the system, and we find that energy, we find it in the ocean because the ocean is warmed. Mostly in the upper one kilometer, a thousand meters or so, but also below. That, that was actually, I was going to ask whether you see the ocean warming more on the surface more. or f more from below. Because that would tell you whether the oceans are warming because yeah. of CO2. Absolutely, and it's very clear it warms from the surface. The, the heat okay. penetrates from the surface down. And the longer we wait, the more clearly we see the warming also at greater depths. But it's more the, typically the, we could say even the, the upper 700 meters, and we know why it's more in the upper 700 meters, uh, 
So, so it really comes from the surface. And, and what we can say now is that if we think about the extra energy we held back on Earth through the additional CO2, so we held the energy back. Now there's one more step I need to explain. Not all that energy goes into the ocean because some, of course, leads to warming at the surface, but if your surface is warmer, some of that energy makes it out of space. Not all, but some. So we really have a three-way balance. The CO2 holds energy back. Some of it goes into the ocean. Some of it eventually leaves, does leave the system because the surface warms. And the big, big thing is we, we have, by now, we have a reasonably good estimate of how much energy we should find in the ocean. And when we look at ocean temperature mm -hmm. rise, we do find it. And even at a quantitative level, we find the right amount of energy that we should be finding according to this three-way balance of CO2 holding energy back, some energy, extra energy leaving the space eventually, and some of it in the ocean. Wait, sorry, I'm just curious. How do you study, like how do you quantify how much energy the whole ocean takes up? We got to measure ocean temperature continuously in a lot of places. Because the ocean is huge. It's huge. It's humongous. Like people and, can't understand how big it is. And, and, the, and, and measuring the ocean in a way is painful because ships are slow and the ocean is huge. Mm. And uh, what people have done is, and it, it was an idea born around the mid-1990s, that we should have uh, floats, as we call them, uh, which are small robots which are deployed in the ocean and they sink to a depth of usually 2,000 meters. They just follow, uh, they follow the currents and every 10 days they rise to the surface, yeah. they measure temperature along the way, they rise to the surface, they trans transmit the information, the data to a satellite, they sink again and then they go on. That's so cool. <laughs> Is that being used? Oh, it's, it's, it's a fantastic thing. It's called Argo, that, that, uh, that system is called Argo. It's Argo floats. There are around 4,000 of these in the world ocean. So they autonomously traverse the ocean. They live for five to seven years, one of them. Yeah. And that has been the backbone. That's why we now have a much, much, much better uh, idea of measurement of the changing energy content of the ocean. And, uh, and why we can be so certain now that, that indeed we have found the right amount of energy, right, in terms of consistent with how much energy has held, been held back by the additional CO2. Mm -hmm. So, so th this is a different argument. This is not a statistical argument. If we sh this is basic, basic physics. Energy is conserved, which means, does not mean the amount of energy remains the same, but the amount of energy we put in, we find it. That's yeah. energy conservation in, in, a, in a broader term. But and, and, and that's why I also like this as an argument for why we know it's, why we're so sure it's humans, because it, it's really the very fundamental physics in its purest form, energy conservation. Yeah. And, and then, as you can tell, even from my sort of simplified depiction, it's a very, very, very different approach from what Hasselmann did. It's more physics-based, not so much statistics-based, but they are fully consistent with each other. And that is one reason why we are so sure. We, we, we try a number of things and they all point at the same direction. So many approaches have been tried to say, is it, is it humans, is it natural fluctuation? And for temperature rise, the outcome is always the same. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that consistency. I know of no, not a single line of reasoning that that has been checked and has been uh, that has been uh, is considered valid, not a single line of reasoning that says there is another explanation for the observed warming. Of course, there have been things that that have been proposed, but they have all been discredited because the effect is too small. It does not 
it's not really it goes in the wrong direction uh, and and so on so there's not a single valid line of evidence scientifically valid line of evidence that says that warming is due to something else okay and all lines of evidence that have been collected point in the same direction and that's why we are so sure if it, it, yeah, it, it, all, it all fits together Again, different for precipitation change, much harder for precipitation change, uh, but but for the temperature rise, this is a very clear thing. So if the ocean warms because the temperature is warming, global temperature is warming, global temperature doesn't always, is not steadily increasing, right? Like it yeah. fluctuates. Yeah. So do we see that the ocean temperature also fluctuates yeah. the same way that the global temperature it, fluctuates? It fluctuates more slowly than the atmosphere. The, the atmosphere flickers. Yeah. Uh, the ocean is uh, slower in, in its fluctuates, but it also fluctuates. That's because it's a lot, it takes a lot more energy to exactly. cool the it's big just, ocean. It's so okay. inert. And everyone living near the sea knows that. Well, actually, those living near the sea and those living in the center of a continent or, or on the east side of a continent the western yeah. side of a continent is influenced by by the sea by the ocean the, the maritime climates and the seasonal cycle is much smaller because the ocean is so inert or even if, if in summer if you just go out sailing or go out in a boat if, if you're away from the coast by it's enough to be away by five kilometers mm. and you tell how cold it gets yeah you better take a jacket because out there <laughs> yeah. it's a lot colder uh, and so and it's just it takes a lot more energy as you say to, to, to change ocean temperatures but the ocean also it also flickers but much less and much more slowly than the atmosphere and the ocean warms the same amount everywhere or does it warm more in certain areas it's also inhomogeneous, not not the same everywhere. Uh, and that's again because of different currents, different absolutely. winds. Absolutely, uh, and and it has and it has to do with uh, the, the 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 energy has to be transferred into the ocean by ocean currents, by vertical ocean currents, and they are more vigorous in some regions. In some regions, uh, some sometimes we have very efficient vertical mixing, mm. and that also takes energy down. In other regions, we have. Uh, currents that st fairly steady currents that tend to go down uh, and, and take heat with them in other regions say typically uh, come back to the tropical to the equatorial eastern pacific there we typically have, have uh, upwelling as we call it upward currents mm -hmm. they bring the cold water from beneath and they make it harder for the warmth to penetrate yeah. So, uh, so yeah. that does not warm as much and so depending on the current systems you have a greater or lesser degree of, of warming in the ocean. So the currents affect how much warming there is in certain places, yep. but doesn't ocean warming also affect or change the currents? Absolutely, yes. So again, that's, yeah, I mean, they that's both work together, so that that's, makes it very that's complicated. Compl that's complicated, and the, um, what the ocean currents, what they are governed by is by two things really. One is the, the wind blowing at the surface and the other is by temperature by, or density contrasts, or mm -hmm. horizontal ten density contrast. Whenever, and density depends on temperature. If temperature goes up, density goes down, but density also depends on the salt content. The saltier yeah. the water, the denser it is. And if you have a region with very strong temperature contrast, that's where we typically have strong currents. You cross the Gulf Stream, for example, that's how sailors 200 years ago more discovered the Gulf Stream. If you, if you come from the south and cross, uh, go to the northwest and cross, uh, cross the Gulf Stream, say again, play towards Boston or so, you cross the Gulf Stream, but you suddenly find it, it gets much, much colder at the surface. Over 50 kilometers, you may have a temperature drop of maybe up to 10 degrees or so, really, really oh. a lot. Uh, and uh, and so uh, and and those very large temperature contrasts over small spacing horizontally, they usually they come for, with strong currents, and we understand why why that is. We understand that. Wait, density. sorry, I have a really yeah. quick clarification yeah. I want to make. So, is the depth of the ocean always the same? No, because that surely also influences it, the temperature change. Yes, but in a in a more a much more subtle way. Oh, okay. And and the and the currents near the surface 
often don't feel the depth, the okay. depth relief. Uh, as we say, they, they are shielded almost. Yeah. It's not universally true and not everywhere, but, but, but often, yes, the, the ocean so floor is rugged, uh, but, but the, the surface currents don't really, don't always feel Okay, it. good, thanks. And, but as I say, what they do feel is temperature contrasts, density contrasts. And, and here we're, we're at this point that you're making. Hmm. So the, the density, in, uh, sorry, the, the currents influence the, uh, influence the temperature, but then the temperature also influences the currents. And that makes the ocean difficult because what, yeah. if you look at that mathematically, you see we this is a really really difficult situation. It's it's what we call a nonlinearity in mathematics, that things are not just things don't just depend on temperature, uh, velocity, or so on, mm. but but things depend on temperature squared that's nonlinear yeah. and when everything's are nonlinear they easily get completely out of hand mathematically and this is why even at the very basic level ocean circulation is difficult theoretically because of that interplay of uh, of temperature temperature differences and and how they are they steer the flow so to speak but then the flow influences the temperature differences and the temperature gradient and contrast and, and that makes that makes it hard this is why we struggle simulating the ocean well yeah exactly and i can imagine it's also a lot harder to simulate the ocean well as opposed to land land is probably a bit easier um it's just because with land i feel like we have a lot more information because it's easier to study whereas the ocean it's also so deep you're not going to go 10 kilometers down to it's, study the ocean. It's difficult, but it's difficult in a different way. Land, land is not as turbulent, that's true, but land is terribly heterogeneous hetero okay. on a very small scale. In the ocean, uh, contrasts are easily wiped out because you have currents that just flow horizontally. On land, can't. Mm, I see. And that is that heterogeneity is the is why land is hard. Mm. Difficulties arise in, in a very different way, and th there's one other thing that makes it hard. <clears throat> okay, the ocean is nonlinear, it's mathematically difficult, but it's governed by the fluid equations, by the laws of motion, yeah. Newton's laws, mass conservation, yeah. energy conservation. By contrast, there is no such a thing as an equation for a tree. Mm does not exist and I doubt it will ever exist. Of course, also when trees grow and decay, you have energy conservation, water conservation, carbon conservation. But that is not sufficient to describe how, how an ecosystem functions. Now, we, photosynthesis is governed by some laws, so, so there are equations that can be used, are being used to, to simulate the land biosphere but you reach the limits of what you can base on laws of nature very quickly. So people who simulate the land biosphere, they have to resort a lot more to plausible assumptions rather than mm. laws of nature than we do when we simulate the ocean. Okay. So their difficulty is, arises in a very, very different way. Yeah. So it's just hard, no matter it's just, what. It's just, it's just hard. always it's hard. hard. It's hard in a different way. And, and also for, for the atmosphere, it's also hard in a different way. Those basic currents, how the how density difference influences current, influence currents. And so that interplay is easy in the atmosphere um, because the, the, for reasons I probably can't go into, the, the, the typical swirls you have in the atmosphere, they are much bigger than in the ocean. Okay. So uh, a, a low pressure system that brings rain yeah. is a thousand kilometers wide. The corresponding piece in the ocean is maybe 50 kilometers wide. So, so much harder to yeah. resolve. But in the atmosphere, they have a lot of other problems. Uh, they have clouds, they have phase transition, mm -hmm. they have radiation interacting with clouds. So the atmosphere has a much richer set of phenomena than the ocean has. But just the fluid motion of the ocean is a lot harder to simulate than it is in the ocean. The, the, as we say, the fluid dynamic itself is much harder in the ocean than in the atmosphere. But the atmosphere, again, has a lot of other things that, yeah. that make their lives hard. So 
so it's um, the, the, the difficulties lie sort of in very different pockets and and what we sometimes find you know, also different difficulties attract different people what we find so that's also curious yeah that is so um we have oceans warming and that contributes to rising sea levels how much should we be worried about the rising sea levels if you're a planner you should worry a lot <laughs> <laughs> of uh no, because uh right as i said earlier sea level rise as a function of warming is as certain as taxes and death yeah. uh, are certain and it will come and um, and we are committed to a certain level of sea level rise not immediately but in the long term and um, and very 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 roughly we can say over thousands of years we're quite sure that every degree celsius of global warming will bring one meter of sea level rise, give and take, roughly a global sea level rise. Now, we haven't done that, we're not there yet, we have one degree of warming, uh, and we're far away from one meter of sea level rise. We will just wait long enough, it'll come. Inexorably, yeah. it will come. And even within the century, uh, that we may get, if we keep increasing emissions, we, we may get one meter of sea level rise, uh, if we don't increase emissions so much, it may be less, uh, but it will be quite a challenge to limit sea level rise to 50 centimeters globally. So it will come, and, and 50 centimeters may not sound so much, but the thing is, for coast, if you think of coastal protection, of course, you have other effects. You have storm surges, for example, like the end was in Ger North northern Germany. And the storm surges, they ride that background sea level rise. And of course, it makes a big difference whether the storm surge gets to just below the crest of a dike yeah. or 50 centimeters more to spill over. And there are many parts of the world where people are not well, well prepared for future sea level rise. Bangladesh is a poster child. They're taking some measures, relatively inexpensive measures, to build definitely more. It houses, if necessary, might be able to float a bit okay. and so on, but still, I mean, Bangladesh is so so uh, low lying and so poor of relief, and uh, that uh, sea level rise will hit Bangladesh hard. That's very clear. Many big cities are right next to the coast, and even things like where you think a wealthy, powerful country like the United States, a Hurricane Sandy, which okay was. Tough luck in a way that hit New York City head on, but just the flooding of the of the subway and so on, and yeah. and and the risk just goes up with sea more sea level rise. So another hurricane like Sandy hitting would mean uh, would would may cause greater uh, problems if sea levels rise by a few tens of centimeters. So sea level rise is really one of the one of the things that that humankind must prepare for very very clearly and, it, and it's not some exotic thing that might happen in some free accidents all come together mm. it's coming for certain so you say it's coming for certain are there ways that we what are the best ways i guess would be a better way to phrase my question what are the best ways in which we can prevent or slow down the rising sea level it, it it's Generally true to, 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 to slow global warming, we need to reduce emissions. That's it's a truism almost, so just, but still. Yeah, find Re ways reduce, to reduce Reduce CO2. emissions, reduce emissions, reduce emissions. CO2 emissions have to go to zero if you want to stabilize temperature. Mm. We have to reach zero. That, that has not sunk into to quite a number of people. We got to go to zero if you want to stabilize temperature. Stabilizing sea level is much harder still. So, uh, so we just because glaciers are melting all yeah anyway they regardless. they melt from the past warming yeah the, sea, the the past warming as I said earlier the past warming commits us to uh, to to quite a bit of future sea level rise and and so there's just for some level of sea level rise there's just nothing we can do yeah. Uh, but we can prevent further further sea level rise 
but uh, it's also clear because some of it we are already committed to, we really need to think about better protections against sea level rise. Yeah, uh, I guess that was also what I was a bit alluding to. I mean, uh, there's always the argument that we need to reduce CO2 emissions, but I think there's less talk on ways that we can, uh, other, other ways that we can prevent the sea rise. I heard, for example, like mangrove, uh, mangroves could be used. Protecting, we, we would not prevent the sea level rise, but we would prevent the effect of sea level exactly. rise. Exactly. And, and yes, uh, and, and I think that is one of the areas where what's it's now uh, fashionable to call it nature-based solutions. Yeah where they are really powerful. I'm more skeptical about nature-based solutions when it comes to mitigation, to preventing, uh, to reducing emissions, but certainly when it comes to adaptation, and especially against storm surges and sea level rise. Yeah. Nature can be a great help. And there, and there are examples already. Also, I have a colleague here from geography, Beate Rata. She works on also the, the, social, the, the social aspects of protecting yourself against sea level rise. And she has examples from from, from small islands and, and also poor communities where you say that the technological solutions are by far not as good. They're good examples. Yeah. You build a wall here, that means where the wall stops, <laughs> it gets all the much worse. And so build like mangroves, building them out there yeah. to, to slowing down the waves and so on. Basically to take the edge off what is yeah. coming. Um, I think another example is New Orleans, uh, which was destroyed by the Hurricane Katrina in 1995. Uh, that also showed how poorly, poorly protected New Orleans was um, against, uh, against storm surges. And, uh, and I heard recently, apparently, some of the, some of the measures were, that were taken go in that direction. I mean, rather than just building a wall, Think how you can make nature work yeah. in your support. Uh, and, and I think generally when it comes to how to deal with climate change, I think more should be done on accepting that some of it will happen. And how can we prepare for it? How can we protect us from it? It's sometimes not popular and, and it, it's gotten a bit better in Germany, but say if, if I'd said that 20 years, uh, gee, uh, we, some, some climate change is going to happen anyhow, so let us prepare for it. Some people who said it, they, they were accused of defeatism and say, hey, you've already given up and you know, almost you've joined forces with the enemy. You've given up on trying to, to mitigate further climate change yeah. by, by wanting to spend money an effort on on adaptation, so yeah. which is uh, I think it's a it's a silly stance uh, to, because uh, we have to prepare. So some of it some of it is going to happen for sure, like sea level rise. Some other things we don't know they may happen, but we don't know. Like heavy precipitation, it's just so hard to predict. So there we better prepare for a certain range of outcomes. Yeah. We don't know which what will happen. But we have a large spread of possible futures there, and we better prepare for that spread. Again, that is preparedness. And, and the difficult thing is there is that, okay, so you prepare for a possible disaster and it doesn't happen for 30 years. Then people come and say, hey, we're wasting our money. See, nothing has happened. What have you told us? And, and, and we've seen that uh, last year in Germany, the, 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 the terrible floodings, mm, which... Yeah. People were very quick to jump to conclusions it was climate change. I kept my mouth shut. I was really glad no one was asking me right after because what I should have said and now can say would have been would have come at the terrible, completely wrong moment that if you look at the fatalities, only a small amount is climate change and most of it is just complete lack of preparedness. Yeah. And that is so, but but that's not something you could say the day after. It would have been oh, definitely that, that not. would have been sort of smart yeah. lack coming and maybe playing in the hands in that case playing in the hands of climate change deniers. But now with a bit of a distance, I mean they had no warning systems to speak of. Yeah. The sirens have been disbanded after the end of the Cold War in Germany, and so, uh, so, so, uh, and 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 if someone had said, "Gee, we need to," well, we have a river that could go wild. And probably the answer would have been, are you nuts? 
I've, I've lived here for 50 years and nothing has ever happened. What are you telling me? Well, I should have told him, look, the, real, the last really, really terrible flood was 200 years ago. Yeah. And that's what we just saw repeated, apparently. And, but to argue with something that happened 200 years ago, and then to say, you've got to spend money on protection. That's a, that's a tough battle to fight. Mm. And I have no recipe for how to do that. Uh, but yeah. but what, what we've seen in, in both instances in North Rhine Westphalia and in Rhine Palatinate, it, it, was, it was parallels in lack of preparedness in both states that, that is breathtaking, but maybe understandable because, gee, it hasn't happened for as long mm -hmm. as we can think back. So why should we prepare for something that's not on our minds? Well, we, yeah. we know the answer why well, maybe we should, but it's very, it's very hard to prepare for something that is not on our minds, let me put it this way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I also, I like to stay optimistic right now that, I mean, as a scientist, I feel like I need to stay optimistic as well, but that science will be able to find nature-based solutions to help slow down or prevent huge disasters from happening because of the rising sea levels. My, my throat is getting dry. I mean, and you're definitely you just, talking a lot more than me. That's true, but you also have a, a f fair share, which should be. We, we want to have a dialogue here, not a monologue. Yeah, I mean, so, it's, uh, it's the expert always. It's more interesting when you talk than when I talk. No, uh, no, but, but you, what, what you throw in is important because, I mean, I, I can tell that you prepared very carefully, so... Um, I... It's just, it's a very interesting topic, and I think in the public we also see so many different opinions on it. We see people that are very apocalyptic about climate change, that it's, it's you know, doomsday, like we're all going to die. And yeah. then we have the climate deniers that yeah. think it doesn't exist. And then we have, like, a wide range in the middle. And so it's, you know, sometimes I just, I like to think about all the different opinions and see, well, where do I even stand? And it's mm. good to talk to an expert about it. Because, and a scientist about because, it. Because, yeah, some of it is opinions, and, but, but some of it is not. And uh, there are a few things, and uh, there are a few things we do know. It's not as if you knew, as if everything was just up in the air and completely uncertain. No, some things we are sure about. And it's really important, I think, to, to, to make that distinction clear enough. You know, some things are beyond doubt. And some others we just don't know, and, and I think we, we need to keep that separate. Yeah. I just quickly, because we're talking about nature-based solutions, so we mentioned the mangrove swamps, but I guess for the audience, if they don't know about it, it's, I think, mangrove swamps, they act to rise the land faster than the sea levels, right? Ah, I didn't even know that, but oh. I, I take your word for it. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, heard... I thought it was just breaking, breaking the flow, but okay. So... No, so that's what I heard because they okay. take up yeah. a lot of the soil. Right. And so that's why they can actually rise the land that makes, faster. That, that's really effective. Then, um, yes, exactly. Indeed. And then they yeah. also obviously yeah. act as a carbon sink. Yeah. But so I heard that that is a nice nature-based solution to think about to prevent rising sea levels. Mm. Do you know of any, any other nature-based solutions? No, I'm, I'm not, I'm really, in, in terms of uh, protecting against the seas, not really off the top of my head in, okay. in addition to the examples, but, but then I, I, I have to say, uh, when it comes to technology, that's not really my strong yeah, point. Yeah, of course. So of course. Uh, the, the thing where I'm more skeptical, I, I can say is, or also some people think when it comes to the mitigation part, like afforestation. Mm. Now, it's clear we should not deforest. It's clear we should not cut down the Amazonian rainforest. That's a terribly bad idea for a number of reasons. But afforestation is often overestimated in its efficacy. Yeah, with afforestation, you mean planting trees. Really planting trees, deliberately planting sink. trees as a, as a carbon sink. And uh, because um, the, the one thing we have to think about and that's sometimes forgotten um, just like for every ton of co2 we emit into the atmosphere only half of it remains in the atmosphere every ton we take out of the atmosphere and that goes into tree only half of that becomes effective 
because in a way the other half then comes out relatively speaking comes out of the ocean and the land biosphere mm. so we have that reverse effect too so yeah. so if we if we pull co2 out of the atmosphere in whichever way yeah half of it is being replenished by the ocean and the and the land because they then take up less than the original it did. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So. For me, I guess the main thing that I was thinking about planting trees, I find it a bit of a, it's a short-term solution, but I don't see it being a long-term solution just because when the trees die, yeah. they release all the they CO2 release. back. It, it, it may buffer, it may buffer the effect and there are people thinking about if you used more wood for construction rather than mm -hmm. concrete, Cement production is also a big CO two emitter, so so we we may it, it it will not be the big solution, but it may have an effect. Yeah, and um, and I I think as long as we understand that whatever we do, we cannot escape the complete transformation of our energy system. We got to bring CO two emissions net the net emissions to zero, and that requires. Uh, uh, a gigantic worldwide upheaval of the current mm. energy su supply systems. As long as we understand that, we're not getting away from that, I would say all, all contributors are welcome. So if you, if you plant more trees, it may have other effects too. Maybe we log the trees and use them for construction work rather than cement. Good. Uh, but we just shouldn't fall into the trap of believing that planting trees will solve the problem. As long yeah, as I we, agree. As long as we burn fossil fuels, we're not solving <laughs> the yeah. problem. That's just first of the magnitude of it. Uh, we, we, we've got to be aware of it. Yeah. We talk about reducing CO2 emissions. We do live in Germany, where a lot of investment has gone into renewable energy sources, but we do not have any nuclear energy. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I, I, I think the, by and large, I, I think the, the way the Germans took is the right way. To the, if you think about using nuclear power and then r shutting it down, uh, I mean, that was haphazard, that was no strategy. Uh, and the conservative government first extended the lifetime, and then after Fukushima, they very quickly said, we want to get out quicker. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think, had, had they decided to phase out nuclear power on a somewhat longer term, I would have had no problem with that. Uh, what sometimes people say, nuclear power is the solution for the climate problem, then I say, nope, it's not. It's much, much, much too expensive. There's okay. one country in the world that builds nuclear power plants to schedule and to uh, budget, and that's South Korea. Every other country has m humongous cost overruns and time overruns. So by the time we have built those nuclear power plants, it's too late almost. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, one could say it's never too late, but we're talking about a 50-year period in which we want to bring CO2 emissions to zero. and it. it it would take this time to build a fraction of the nuclear power plants. So, so there's a big distinction between keeping them running and building new ones. There, there's another example. If you, if you look at the total supply of nuclear power worldwide in terms of gigawatts power uh, created, the installed power of new, of new renewables, the currently installed powers, power, in two years, it's the same power as all nuclear power plants together. Okay, wow. Now, that may not be usable the whole time. Yeah. Fair enough, and, but even if we discount that and say it's 50%, then we will be at four years. Mm, yeah, yeah. So, so and, and that's what we're doing right now, and that's compared to all nuclear power plants together. So, so to me, the belief in building more nuclear power plants is completely misguided because it misses the opportunity of creating power uh, from renewals, plus, of course, storage. Storage system, intelligent system, they have to be built. They don't exist yet. But mm -hmm. if I look at how long it takes to build nuclear power plants, even in countries that are favorable, very inclined, like Britain, even they have huge trouble with the new plants they are trying to build right now. So from a purely practical standpoint, uh, it's, it's not going to work. Wouldn't you think it would be more efficient, though, to keep the ones that we already have yes. running? I, I think I would have... Uh, 
I, I, I thought this... Just because the cost is not... Because the cost the, mainly comes from the, building the, a nuclear power plant. They are written, they are written off and the, and the completely, still completely unsolved problem of what to do with the nuclear waste. The problem is huge and unsolved, but it's getting marginally yeah. bigger. Uh, no, I, 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 th I think I would have um, th that. I, I thought it was too quick a move out, and but as I said, it, there was no, uh, there was no real strategy. I mean, the 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 the, uh, the social democrat green government said we want to phase out nuclear power mm. plant, and then the conservative government extended yeah. the one time, and they said we we're getting out faster. I think it was faster than even planned before. So that was all sort of just uh, reacting to the to the current situation. I think uh, also maybe we're reacting to the public's opinion. It also yes. Yeah. And and I think in both cases, I I, I think I would have wished for a bit more rational policy, but uh, but still I think by and large, I mean it is said sometimes by by circles also in Germany, or oh, or oh, you're giving up on 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 climate change mitigation. By phasing out nuclear power, power, I I disagree with that. Uh, I really think the uh, the the way to or to, to go for renewables uh, that's a thing, and and it's a lot cheaper. We see that. Mm. We see now now how the price of renewables how how dramatically cheap they are for for power for production yeah. compared to others, and in, in a way that no one would have foreseen. Yeah. And so so I I think that that direction is very clear. Now it's it's only part of the issue. Transportation is hard. Buildings are hard, but I would say that it's also part of the argument is political. I think that if we don't even manage for power production, for electrical power, then how are we going? To, if we don't solve the relatively easy problem, how do we solve the harder one? Uh, so it's also part of creating a momentum. Now that is not an economic argument. That is not the. It's a, mm. This is really a political argument to say, let us build a success story, to say to say, okay, look, we can do it. A, we can do it, and B, we're not suffering by doing it. We're actually doing fine by doing it. Yeah. And I think we need those those sort of successful, uh, success stories because if we don't have them, if Prevention of further climate change is being perceived as just a sacrifice, uh, just something you uh, and, and you don't want to do it, but you have to. Then it's not going mm. to work because no one is is playing a sacrificial lamb for the whole world. It's not going to happen. We know. Exactly. We know that there's plenty of empirical evidence of that that people are not willing to do that, and so I think these kind of success stories and saying, look, we manage the transformation of part of what we do, and we're doing well doing that. I think that that's the way to go. Yeah. So you think that um, using wind, solar, I guess those would be the two main renewable energy sources that you Certainly could that use here in Germany. In Germany yeah. Exactly. You think that, yeah, in the upcoming years, that would be the best solution yeah. to get to net yes. zero. <clears throat> yes, and you also think that it would be possible for Germany to get to net zero just, or would we still need to be using natural gas? Just because solar and wind don't give you constant energy yeah, supplies. Um, I, I'm skeptical about the natural gas, but, but that may be the thing, especially the, the debate we're currently having uh, about do we prepare for more use of natural gas uh, yeah. and liquefied natural gas. I don't know. Uh, the, and, and I don't envy our, uh, our economics and yeah. climate minister, who's now being beaten by the green movement and saying, how can you invest in, in liquefied natural gas? And, and I, I say, hmm. Maybe they are right. Maybe maybe not. Uh, because I mean the, as often in climate we we have the tension between short term and long term interests and uh, and and if you don't serve the short term interests, you have a crisis. You have a short term crisis, uh, and and you're out of office quickly. Yeah. So, so you you can't just bank on the long term interest. This is not going to work. Uh, so, so I I don't know whether whether they are the current government is betting too much on gas. Uh, maybe they are, but I I find that hard to judge. Yeah. 
what I what I am sure of is is one thing. It would be too short sighted only to look at solutions within Germany. I do think that it, it uh, we have to look more broadly uh, and and more at the European level. I mean, we, we have this story like solar solar energy and and photovoltaics and the question of like there was this company. Desert Tech. They tried to build it in Morocco, I think. Okay, and, uh, I have not heard yeah, of that. Yeah, that was that 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 was about. I think it started fifteen years ago and died ten years ago because of the political oh. instability in Northern Africa. Yeah. And and of course you got to trans to transport that power, uh, but now there's more discussion in Spain. I mean, Spain okay. has mm. kind of almost deserts so or has deserts. I'm not sure what the official classification is. Yeah. So a collaboration with Spain, I mean, about uh, photovoltaics in Spain, uh, maybe built with German money, German investment, would could make eminent sense. Yeah. Again, transmission losses, and so you have to think about it. Uh, and I, I, I don't know what they are and what can be done. But I am quite sure that uh, that if, if you think more broadly about uh, European countries collaborating on that, that th this yeah. may well be the thing. I've heard people say, oh, Germany can never be climate neutral, you know, even with power. They cannot do that. And, and that's sometimes said, what's all this nonsense? Well, that's a wrong conclusion. I mean, it may well be true that Germany cannot be completely self-sufficient, but but the conclusion cannot be that we keep importing oil from Russia. Well, exactly. <laughs> but the conclusion then has to be, hey, why don't we get together with our friends in Europe, like Spain, yeah. and say, hey, can we can we strike a deal? Strike a deal. And, and would the cost of going to Spain to to harvest some solar energy and then transporting it back to Germany would that still be a lot cheaper than building a nuclear power plant? I expect so. Yes, okay. but I'm 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 not not sufficiently an expert on that. But I expect so. Looking looking at the cost estimates I've seen of the British power plants, my yeah. guess is yes. It would yeah. be because you would have a you would have an economy of scale. The one, the one that we have uh, also now, and that there were some of the really impressive figures that were shown in the Working Group 3 IPCC report that came out in April. Uh, yeah, in April. They, they, they showed just the cost per, per, per unit power uh, created mm -hmm. and for renewables. And, and it was just yeah. unbelievable uh, how, how that cost has plummeted over the last yeah. 20 years. And so, uh, and, and as far as I understand, it's not. It wasn't a technological breakthrough. Yeah. It was just more efficient production because because uh, things scaled up. Yeah. Well, I guess the demand increased, right? Yeah. So then it's easier yeah. to get to economies yes. of scale. Right. And my yeah, my thought would be just with nuclear. I guess ever since I don't know the nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties, the demand for nuclear has gone down. Public opinion has gotten a lot more negative about it. So is that also influencing the fact that the cost is staying so high? That may may be, but the but I I see two other things that would speak against that the effect of public opinion. One is, for all I can tell, nuclear power plants are uninsurable. Oh, that goes up. Ooh. No insurance would do wow. that okay. because we know. I mean, just look at what happened in Fukushima. Yeah. There's an area of several tens of square kilometers which are de facto uninhabitable. Yeah. And who would uh, can we begin to imagine what what economic damage that is? And and that is no, no one ensures that. Hmm. And the other is uh, no one ensures or takes financial guarantees for what to do with the nuclear waste. Yeah. It's, if, if that wasn't subsidized by the states, it wouldn't happen. No private company does that. Yeah. Because we have no idea what the long-term cost of that is. And, uh, and you can see, look at the agreement in, in Germany. Basically, there was a certain number of billions of euros that the industry paid to the state, but then the risk was transferred to the state. So, so the public takes the risk for what to do with it. With the uh, with the nuclear waste and and what to do with highly reactive nuclear waste is completely unclear. Mm -hmm. No one knows what to do.
I feel play. like I'm totally playing devil's advocate <laughs> right fine. now, and that's I'm fine. going to. No, that's but fine. That's what fine. I'm just I know, wondering. I, oh, yes, no, no, and I think we need to ask this question, these questions, and and and, uh, but it's just that. Uh, so so it's it, it it it's an element of of of, of risk analysis, of course, and. And, the, and this is the one example where I, I find the use of the precautionary principle adequate um, um, because the, if things go wrong with nuclear power, they can go wrong on such yeah, a grand right. scale. Mm -hmm. and, and that is different from, and, and which says that the past is not a good guide, the risk from or events from the past is not, are not a good guide for what could happen in the future. Uh, whereas if you take even if you take coal, of course we had many more people dying in coal mines than from nuclear power. That's true, but we have a pretty good idea of, of how big the risk can become with yeah. nuclear power. I, w I would claim no, we don't. Mm. And uh, when Fukushima is an example, and uh, and and that that there was no big city there. I mean the, the thought of being. A nuclear power plant or something happening like in Fukushima and something happening with a really big city close by. Yeah. Would we ban and have banned Tokyo? And, oh. and, and and the other thing is and, and that is that is something where, where some proponents will say, Oh, this could never happen in Germany. They're always quick to say after Three Mile Island and Harris you know, uh, Harrisburg they say yeah. it could never happen in Germany. Ours are built differently. Uh, Chernobyl, this could never happen in Germany. And yeah, maybe. But what struck me in Fukushima is that such a high-tech country like Japan, I mean, why did the meltdown occur? Because yeah. of the most stupid, low-tech low -tech error that may, you can imagine. All the emergency diesel power generators all drowned in the same hole. They were not protective against the mm -hmm. flood. And they were not usable, and therefore the power plant had no power, and they could not cool yeah. the reactors. Exactly. And this had nothing to do with nuclear safety design. This yeah. just had to do with, you could almost say, common sense. You yeah. don't put all your eggs in one basket, but they did put all their eggs in one basket, so that was a low-tech design error, and they did it. And who's to say that in a German power plant, such a similarly stupid mistake is not it happening? Always happen. And so, uh, so I mean, the, the, they were so different. Each each error was it was design error. Some were at a higher tech level. Chernobyl was an, a completely uncontrolled experiment, uh, running into the into the unstable regime of the power plant. Fukushima was a s stupidity with the with yeah. the generators. And who's to guarantee that something stupid is not happening? Oh yeah, in Harrisburg they they forgot to open the valve for the for the feeding for the cooling water feeding. Mm. They, the, after maintenance, they don't didn't reopen. Now this yeah. is low tech. <laughs> yeah, and, but, you, but, but, it, but it happens. It's stupid that these things happen. But, but that that's the point. Stupid things happen. Yeah. And so uh, and 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 the and the the potential risk. Is high, and that that is why I, I have to admit I, I would rather accept a, a bit more in global warming, yeah, than having that to me uncontrollable risk sort of at the tail of the probability distribution. Yeah, yeah and actually going back to the waste because we were talking about nuclear waste and how we don't know what to do about it. Actually, so with solar panels though, there's quite a lot of waste yeah. in solar panels, especially because I. I'm not sure what um, what metal is in solar panels. Oh, I. I would, there, there are num I there, there, there are number. No, no. F fair enough. Uh, the the, uh, the a lot of the high tech products we're using there, they come with their own pollution problems. Yeah. No question, and and I think we ought to get a lot. We collectively we ought to get a lot better in reusing, recycling, and whatever. Um, still thinking of the waste, if it was highly reactive nuclear waste and whatever it is that comes out of that, uh, uh, the, the the solar panels. Yeah, I, I'll double check I, that. I see. Yeah, I, I see. There, there is no contest because I mean, there, I, I've seen a statement recently. Of someone who was a converted uh, says she was she converted from being against nuclear power now in favor said. 
oh, after 500 years, it's no longer dangerous. And I thought, well, where, where does this come from? I, and I think she was referring to, to the medium level reactive material that mm -hmm. indeed has cooled off after 500 years, but not the highly reactive one, unless it is being transformed to something else. And that's a whole new industry. It is, yeah. Uh, maybe in 100 years, they will have the solution. But even 500 years, safeguarding something for 100 years, I mean, we have to look hard to find a political unit in the world that has lasted for 500 years. Of course, China has existed as a state for longer, but I mean, to safeguard something for 500 years, mm. it's an incredibly long time. Yeah. And something that's really dangerous. Yeah. So. And I guess the same goes for solar panels. Like, I think the investment has to go into trying to find ways to to take the material out of the the solar panels that don't work anymore, that have yep. expired basically, rather than just extracting the metals yep. again. Yep. That's really where, because if we can get that right, then it yep. just makes the use of solar panels yep. so much better. And, and, and I think, and that is something where it's much easier for me to see a solution because uh, we've we found many solutions for yeah. many things. Also when it comes to batteries, we've seen how they exactly. get cheaper. Again, uh, uh, environmentally, no, not friendly, not usually. Uh, that there's work to do. Also, some people say uh, with renewables, uh, we, we don't have the storage. Uh, well, yes, but we're working on it. And people are working on it with high speed all over the world. Mm. And so, so uh, and, and we've, see, we've seen the development in the past. And I think uh, there's good reason to believe it will continue in the future. By contrast, I've seen not in terms of quick development when it comes to nuclear waste. I've, I've seen nothing that, that has been quick. Yeah. And, um, and, and of course, there, there is also the political side. Uh, if, if you look at the, at the history of West Germany, the, the, the state and the party that pushed nuclear power uh, most fervently was... Uh, Bavaria and the Christian, uh, what's it called, the C Christian Social Union, mm -hmm. and if you now look, who most determinately says, no nuclear waste facility can ever be in our state, it's mm -hmm. Bavaria. They refuse everything, and mm -hmm. so so you have this uh, situation of hip hypocrisy that uh, people don't want to live with the consequences of their decisions. In this case, the party doesn't want that particular party, doesn't want yeah. to live with the consequences of their decision. And, uh, and we, we can see that that, of course, makes it extra hard because they're not in my backyard. Then, then comes in once people know what they would be getting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and that has to be factored in. So, but but the, the physics, the pure physics problem of dealing with that stuff is... is yeah. Yeah, so then clearly solar and wind mm -hmm. yeah. are the way to reach <laughs> yes, net zero absolutely. here in Germany. Absolutely. But yeah. I also think um we should probably make more use of putting uh wind turbines into the ocean. Just cuz you can there's just so much more wind <laughs> there. It would be so much more yeah, efficient. Yeah, I, I don't know. The the thing is the current speed the, it's uh, oh, do do you mean offshore just just uh, I guess more onshore. But maybe no, no, no. Do do but do you mean uh, so to to use the the ocean currents directly, no. or to you or the just wind. to put, uh, or the wind over the ocean? Yes, yes. yes. The no, wind no, over I, the ocean. I, I, it's I so much stronger. The, the, it's, it's so much stronger, and then, and also think, and yes, you have less of a problem that people people don't like the side of them, um, and so on. And of course, no, nothing is ever for free. And then if you if you install a park somewhere offshore. Then of course you are influencing ecosystems and so on. That's true, yeah. but um, but I think you you're not getting anything for free. And 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 you're right, of course, that the uh, the, uh, the wind is stronger. The the, the economic balance it's, it's it's unclear to me because of course it's it's also hard to, to direct well. some, uh, to direct something. But but I th that is something where where I I do think uh, solutions will be found uh, that this can be done. What what uh, annoys me is that especially the conservative parties in Germany that they blocked the the further building of wind power 
uh, wind power plants in, in Germany because they, they I heard that the, the, the distance rules again Bavaria number yeah. one but no time was failure also uh, where uh, uh, they were blocking uh, really blocking it and, and the installation of renewables has slowed down in the uh, in the late uh, tens uh, of the century and I remember about five years ago the then uh, federal uh, economics minister said we've got to cap the, the installation of new renewable power plants. I said, why? Yeah. Why we need to, it was a political goal to cap that. And, uh, and, so, and so it has gone down. Now, now it's, it's reversing, but uh, to me it's, it's, it is clear that this is the way to go. I guess one of my final questions would be, how easy is it for you to keep like politics and the science separate? Because I'm assuming that you talk to politicians as well, or you know, if you were uh, helping with the IPCC, you surely have an influence. And I think that sometimes it can be hard to, to keep these two separate. I, I try to keep them quite separate. The thing is, uh, w one thing that helps me, no, maybe I should start in a different way. I, Someone pointed me to Max Weber not so long ago, so I read a bit of Max Weber, and I don't know much about sociological literature, but in, in, he wrote in, in political science, it's much harder, and, and he apparently was the first to formulate that explicitly, that it's a different thing to analyze scientifically how politics work and societies work, and to make politics. Yeah. And what he suggested is you, you really ought to keep the object of your desire at a distance. And that's what I try to do. Um, that's, a, that's a one thing. So I, I, try, I try to stay out of concrete political things. I mean, I was asked a while ago, would you, uh, would you uh, uh, sign a declaration against building a coal-fired power plant here? And I said, no, I'm, I'm staying out of these concrete things. But then one thing that has helped me is uh, that, that, of course, we people do do research on how the, the politics of climate change. How do societies deal with it? How, how do social movements operate? And here in Hamburg, we have an excellence cluster. We call, we're funded by the uh, DFG, the German Research mm -hmm. Council, called Climate, Climatic Change and Society. And I would claim, certainly in Germany, but I think even in the world, we, may, we are certainly among the strongest, if not the strongest, in how much social science of climate change we do. Really, the social dynamics. Okay. And that has taught me a lot. So these people look at how the public creates narratives about climate change, because they... they, they, they they're not created by science, they were created by yeah. others. So the, uh, the, the, the picture of climate change is constructed in the social dialogue. And they study social movements. How big is the influence of Fridays for Future? How big is it really? Yeah. What is it we assume it is? And what, what does it really do? They look at investment patterns and divestment patterns. Uh, some of them, the company, large companies with large CO2 uh, uh, footprints, how do they make investment decisions? Do they change their investment decisions? Yeah. And so we do a lot of that research here in Hamburg, and I'm, I'm the, one of the deputy spokespersons of that, that cluster, so I've learned a lot from them. And, and what I've also done, a totally different angle, for many years with a colleague, I've done experiments in the lab where people play for money. Okay. And it's all, it always has a climate change framing. And so we explore whether people are willing, they, they can make real money. It's usually played with first year students, they can make real money, mm. not huge sums, but they play for 45 minutes, an hour, and they can make between, say, 10 euros and 50 euros. And 50 euros for one, one hour's work for first year student, that's a yeah. very trivial amount. They, they want to make that money. Yeah. So we get to their real motives that they, they it, it, it's not role playing. They want to make that money. They yeah. serve their interest, which is legitimate interest, we serve it. And from all these things, I think I've gained, for a, for a hardcore national scientist, I would say I've gained a, a, a pretty solid understanding of political processes. And uh, so um, 
I am looking at, at, at the political process and at the social discourse and, and I try to understand and, and then I would comment on what works and what does not work. And uh, so I, I would say I'm staying out of the day-to-day -day politics, but I, I do look at what has happened. And, and then a colleague of mine here from the, the social science, she actually said a year ago, well, you've changed your tune because I've been asked in an interview, what can I as an individual do to okay. prevent further climate change? And I said, look, of course, there are these things that are sensible, uh, less car uh, usage, more public transportation, but that, that's not going to change the political system. And we're going not, we need to change the energy transform. We need to change, uh, transform the energy system. But the one thing I believe you can do is make sure people run ministries who take climate change seriously. And in the old government, we had an economics minister and we had a transportation minister who did everything in their power to block mm. further prevention yes, of climate no, change. And I would still claim that was an analysis of the political system. And, and, and I think what we see now, even if people are not always happy with what the government does, but we've seen a huge improvement through its changing government. I'm a lot more optimistic now uh, yeah. than I was before. So now you could argue, did I, was that, was I being political? Maybe I was, but it's also, I would say, it's an analysis with, of the political situation with a minister who doesn't care or is unable. Mm. Uh, this is not going to work. Yeah, that's very true. It, and and it's, it, it may be a, almost a truism, but still, the ministers are powerful. And we see, especially in Robert Habeck, uh, we see that fantastic change that has taken place at the level of that ministry. So, um, so I've done that. So in that, in that sense, I am not, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not saying in the ivory tower, I still try to, 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 um, to acknowledge that a scientific analysis and a scientific result, even a scientific analysis of a political system is something very, very, different from making politics yeah but i i probably am a bit more forthcoming now in, in, in speaking my mind because i in some way then I, I, I did get fed up certainly i got fed up with that old government yeah i mean i think it's very important for scientists to speak their mind and make the narrative it is our job to do that as well so but it's just, I do feel like climate change is a topic that is very scientific, but very politicized these days yeah. as well. And, and the, the difficulty is, I certainly do not want to come across as an activist. The, the difficulty is, I think, uh, with, with activism is that, of course, some people have to be activists. Of course, political change only occurs because yeah. people are active, no question. But mixing the roles of a scientist and an activist, the the... The, the fear I would have is that I, I underestimate the possibility that I'm wrong scientifically. And I, I got to be open for that. And, and if somehow mm. being right means it serves what I like to see to be done politically, that's when I'm getting skeptical. Yeah. Um, am, I, am I as willing? I mean, it's always hard to, to admit I'm wrong. I was wrong. It's never easy for a scientist or anyone else, but also for scientists. We always say, oh, yeah, new evidence comes in and we revise our statement. Ah, come on, it's not that simple. We, mm. Everyone who's doing science knows yeah. <laughs> that it's not true. But, uh, but I think it's harder still if you suddenly say, ooh, it would be better if I was right because that helps this cause. That's getting dangerous. And so that's why I think distance to the object of your desire is an important thing to, 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 to increase the chance of being self-critical enough. Yeah. But I have no, no recipe for, for, for where, where to draw the line. I mean, I, I think we as a field have an obligation to engage in the public discourse, no question. Whether we, would I be in favor of building this or that LNG terminal? <laughs> that I find difficult. And there's also the question, do I have, do I have the knowledge? Yeah. Uh, and 
and I and and also I I see a number of quick transfers of scientific analysis, especially in economics, into political demands where I feel quite mm -hmm. uneasy. And that's something I say. I don't think that your theory carries you far enough to <laughs> yeah to, to 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 place this demand. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this really nice conversation. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, thank you again. <laughs> thank you. I enjoyed it too. <laughs> so That's it. Thank you all so much for listening. If you would like to learn more about Professor Joachim Marotzke and his research, you can check out his website. And if you like our podcasts, make sure to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thanks again for listening. Bye. Austrian Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group known as the Austrian Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Srinath Rankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye.